Um, my name is Matthew Brennan. I'm a PhD student in the School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering. And what I'm going to talk about today is work that I did as part of my qualifications exams last fall, which was to, um, in collaboration with a class in the art history department that was taught by Professor Giles Knox, uh, create some virtual reality experiences that would be used by students in conjunction with what they were learning in the class. Um, so I'll jump straight into it and sort of the overview of uh, what I'll talk about is kind of very briefly why I picked virtual reality as the medium, um, how I made the applications, and how they were integrated alongside the course material. Um, and then can do a demo of it, hopefully, and take any, answer any questions that anybody has. So as I'm sure probably a lot of you know, uh, commercial virtual reality headsets, commercially available headsets, consumer available headsets, have really only been capable and widely available since uh, spring of 2016 when the commercial consumer version of the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive were released. Um, and those have been the main two over the past few years and they're now releasing um, wireless versions of those that aren't as powerful but get rid of all the outside and tracking and um, necessary desktop computer or powerful laptop and so on. Uh, in January 2016, uh, Game Informer dubbed 2016 the year of virtual reality because there's a lot of anticipation about this technology. Uh, and to an extent, it lived up to it, but it's still not as widely available or uh, easy to use as it was originally thought. So I will talk a little bit about, too, the kind of operationalization of these VR apps at a large institution being Indiana University. And uh, the difficulties that were involved for me personally, this being the first time I'd ever done it, making um, standalone applications that uh, people were supposed to download and be able to use without any instruction or input from me. Um, and hopefully it would be a good experience for them, which I think for the most part it was. There were some hiccups along the way, but uh, I'll talk about that later on. So just a brief uh, sort of background of, of why I picked virtual reality is because it's not, in concept, it's not really new. Technologically, it's relatively new. But in concept, it's always been about this ability to be surrounded by visual stimuli that is not there in reality. So this, for example, is the, the Villa of Livia uh, frescoes, which are a dining room, an ancient Roman dining room that was found very well preserved uh, in Rome. And on all sides, you have these depictions of vegetal and uh, animal life that is simulating a rustic, lush countryside, but in the city center of Rome. Um, the same can be seen in the Italian Renaissance, where you have uh, in the Villa Farnesina, also in Rome, sort of false perspectives covering every single wall of this room. And so that's really going back to, you know, 50 AD, the idea has always been to sort of enter a visual world that doesn't really exist. Uh, so the potential for this in um, art and architectural education, I think is, is huge uh, because there's this on the left is an example of a traditional art history textbook. In fact, the textbook that was used in the class that I made these virtual reality applications for. And the way that those classes are often taught is with very much like I'm actually presenting right here, which is static imagery on a slide. There'll be some videos later, but uh, it's essentially showing in 2D static imagery um, these flattened views of what in reality is a very complex immersive uh, architectural space. So when you apply that to virtual reality, you, um, you get this sort of a, a much different uh, experience of an object when it's to scale 
uh, when you are sort of in the space versus even when you're looking at a 3D model, um, sort of a discrete object that you can spin around versus an interactive immersive environment. And you can see that here uh, on the left is one of the 3D models in a web viewer that was used in the class, the art history class. And on the right are these diagrams that is typically how this content is presented. When you're talking about these complex narratives where each side of the room, in this case it's a chapel, uh, are thematically communicating and visually communicating with each other um, versus what the experience you get on the left, the 3D model. Uh, obviously the, the potential for immersive technologies in learning and education has long been acknowledged by, uh, for one, the military. Um, they have been using flight simulators since the mid 1900s. And there's even a popular uh, video game that was developed by the army um, called America's Army that is meant to simulate combat. Uh, when I was reviewing literature on the application of virtual reality to education, the majority of what I could find focused on uh, the sciences rather than the humanities, such as art history and architectural history or architectural design. And, but I found that what I could find all referenced learning theory. So for, for the most part, this literature talked about the potential without really giving any concrete examples of the implementation. Um, and when even the ones that did talk about implementation in the case of physics or medicine um, and biology, all referenced uh, learning theory, in particular, these main concepts. And uh, this guy, Chris Dede, is uh, at Harvard, and he is one of the big proponents of the military's use of immersive technologies. Um, so the first one of these, multiple perspectives, or the ability to change perspective, uh, has to do with offering two different viewpoints. And the way that you can get an abstracted symbolic overview of either an environment that's far too large to take in in a single glance or a concept that is too detailed uh, is the exocentric view, whereas an egocentric view is a more first person uh, view. An example of this is a 3D model I made as part of uh, this Virtual Meridian of Augustus project where the subject of the study, this meridian, which is essentially a, a solar marker, uh, now in the basement of a building in Rome, uh, but only a portion of it is exposed. So in order to see the relation of this portion of it to all of these other sub-basements, uh, I made 3D scans of the not only the street front, this is maybe a bit of a confusing um, image here, but these are all hallways going into courtyards in the interior of apartment buildings. And when you have all of those together and you overlay the uh, 3D model of the meridian line, which is the orange and yellow lines there, you see how all these spaces relate to each other. And you can start um, piecing them together and seeing where exactly what parts of this artifact are underneath all this modern construction. Situated learning uh, is a theory of learning, as it says on the screen. So if you want authentic context, activities, and assessment, coupled with guidance from, expert, from experts, for example. And uh, this I'll talk about as I specifically reference this sort of, this concept in the, the VR applications. And then transfer is um, application of knowledge learned in one situation to that of another. Um, and when you have presentational instruction, as in uh, an art history lecture, for example, where the instructor's talking about what the, these flat 2D images on the screen uh, versus a highly realistic virtual reality environment where you, the user feels as though they're in the space, that's an example of far transfer. So translating a 2D image into the, ex the immersive experience versus near transfer, where you have an immersive experience to when you for example, go visit that place in reality or you visit num another similar place, uh, it's much easier to transfer the, the learning techniques you learned in one to the new one. And all this really comes back to is this idea of presence, which is 
uh, something unique, I think, offered by virtual reality and virtual environments. And this has a, not only a powerful motiv motivational effect on learning, um, but it also has that sort of cool factor that just makes uh, virtual environments intriguing and uh, enjoyable and that in turn also leads, can lead to better learning. But my goals here that I'll talk about later were not to quantify uh, learning increase or anything like that. It was more about the user experience and the design, the learning design of these. And to understand why all this is important for uh, art historical education, it's important to understand how central uh, the role of the visual is in art historical education and study. Um, and there are some quotes here by Ryan, who's a art historian. And in these, he's talking about um, high resolution 3D photographs, or high resolution photographs, not necessarily uh, 3D models. But he makes a good point that art historians always want to have access to the original. So I'm not uh, suggesting here that these 3D models are, can stand in for the original or can be used in, in place of studying the original uh, artifact, but that in many cases uh, they can give added benefit over the original where, for example, even if you go to these sites, you won't be able to get right up to the fresco work. You won't be able to go 20 feet up in the air and stand eye to eye with some of the, the figures in the frescoes, um, which you can do in the, the 3D models. And uh, one of the pertinent quotes here is where uh, Ryan expresses his uh, desire to erect scaffolding to examine upper sections of the present facade. And this is something with it, before I had read this quote that I was interested in implementing in the, the virtual reality environments. So as I said, high resolution 3D models combined with immersive virtual reality can take some of the best parts of on-site study of an artwork uh, with this sort of fluid combination of information. So audio information, visual information, historical information that you can get on the fly and embed in the, the virtual environments and the revisitability of textbooks. So you could start one of these VR applications up whenever you wanted and essentially revisit these sites however often you wanted without having to pay for a plane ticket to Italy or um, be constrained by the opening times of the museum and the costs of getting there and so on. So when it came to implementing these VR experiences in the fall 2018 class, uh, the structure was was not, it was sort of to augment the in-class lecture with a 3D model, uh, as well as to offer four corresponding VR experiences that the students could do uh, in the Wells Library 3D lab here uh, outside of class time. So the in-class lecture would make use of these static slides, as well as a 3D model that was uh, presented on Sketchfab. And then the out of class work would still use the textbook that um, the students did readings from, as well as the VR experiences. So sort of uh, two 3D interactive add-ons to each component of the class. And the content was all thematically linked. So it's all um, examples of Renaissance fresco work that progress more or less chronologically. Um, and comes from all over Italy. The, the first one, the Allegory of Good and Bad Government, is in Siena. The Arena Chapel is in Padua, near Venice. The Brancacci Chapel is in Florence, and the Legend of the True Cross is in Arezzo. So all of these followed the same format that I uh, essentially developed in the, the first two weeks of, the, of work on it, uh, which was to use a photorealistic 3D scan, a photogrammetric scan of the interior space uh, to scale, obviously, because it's a real place. It has a real scale. Um, it wouldn't make sense that it would it'd be inaccurate in that uh, aspect. Uh, teleportation style VR locomotion, which is simply where you point at the ground with one of these VR controllers. When you release the button, you're teleported there through a sort of fade in, fade out um, technique. And that's to eliminate motion sickness. 
There was, and then for each of these, I used uh, audio content provided by Smart History. They are a nonprofit that was spun off of Khan Academy. And there are two art historians based in New York who do lots of YouTube videos of all of this content and more. Um, and I contacted them. I had worked with them before. And I contacted contacted them to ask them if I could use uh, their audio and they said they're more than happy. So that was uh, great because they'd already done it and I didn't have to re-record uh, all this me talking essentially. Um, then there was this idea of the virtual scaffolding which uh, would facilitate close-up inspection of really any aspect of uh, these frescoes whether it was 20 feet up in the air or uh, even just a little bit off the ground. So as I mentioned earlier, the objectives were rather than to quantify learning gains uh, or, or how VR impacted the learning. It was more so to um, develop user experience design and then get uh, feedback from the students and test out how how these virtual reality uh, interfaces worked and what worked well and what didn't. And over the course of this, I made a lot of changes. Uh, and then there's obviously the question of how to operationalize this stuff at a large university. So obviously in the classroom, the art history classroom, they don't have 20 vibes. Uh, they can't have 20 vibes there. Here at Wells, I think there were six uh, that were available for use, as well as scattered around at other places on campus. So there was a question of um, whether I would bring a laptop with a vibe to the class on certain days, and maybe a couple students might use it, or they would be able to come here and use it on in their free time. So that was a question too. And then uh, obviously the integration of the 3D and VR assets with what is traditionally a lecture and textbook-based course, and how, how that works and what that looks like when the, the instructor is actually using it. Uh, so the technologies that I used, the primary one, the foundation of all of it was photogrammetric modeling, which is essentially taking a number of photographs of an object or an environment in this case. Uh, it's often used for the digitization of a discrete object, in this case, a ancient Greek bronze sculpture uh, that's in Rome. This is the Terme Boxer. And I used it uh, to digitize environments, so to create a 3D model of an environment. And this is, uh, for each one of these interior spaces, I used 60 to 200 photographs that I took over the past summer. And those were combined into a photogrammetric 3D model that got its structure, so the mesh and the coloration from the photographs. Um, that's how photogrammetry works. and. They started out very high resolution, so hundreds of millions of polygons, and then I reduced them significantly uh, for web and VR use. The web viewer I used was Sketchfab simply because I'm familiar with it and I've been using it for quite a while, and it'll run in a web page without any plugins. I was also able to mark up the models with annotations, which are numbered sort of hotspots on the model that the instructor could click on or he could click through them using an arrow and the scene would automatically move around. This is an example of the uh, screen capture of uh, one of the 3D models. So it's a relatively low resolution simply because it needs to um, be able to load quickly on a, a mobile phone or a laptop computer. Um, and on uh, internet bandwidth of varying speeds. Uh, and then this is just simply scrolling through the annotations, which are keyed to um, significant portions in the instructor's talk. So I collaborated with him on, on what I should highlight uh, and what the annotation should say. Yeah, let's see if I can... Okay. 
for making the virtual reality uh, applications, the interactive VR, I used Unity um, simply because I'm more familiar with that than Unreal Engine, which is the only other one I've had any experience with. And Unity is a game engine with uh, built-in VR functionality. I used the Steam VR plugins and the VR TK, which is the VR toolkit. And then some of the interactive elements, uh, like the, the coding that would trigger the, the audio to start and stop was done in C Sharp. This is a screen capture of the Arena Chapel, so the same 3D model that uh, you just saw in the, the web viewer, but now this is running in Unity, so um, it has a floor, it has these audio nodes, uh, and at each one of these sort of numbered pseudo-chronological nodes is where there'd be a snippet of audio from Smart History. I essentially chopped up their, their audio about the place uh, into portions that could be put in front of whatever they happen to be talking about at that uh, point in the clip. So in Smart History's YouTube videos, they will often begin with an introduction to the space or the, the artwork that they're talking about. And then they will go through it in a more or less uh, linear way. And I was able to simply chop up those uh, portions of the audio and have them correspond to geographic locations within the space, even though um, obviously in a YouTube video, it doesn't move around at all. They just have static images come up on the screen. After these VR experiences, let's see that is next. Uh, I gave the instructor uh, something called the presence questionnaire, which is a slightly modified questionnaire of the the one developed by Whitmer and Singer as part of their uh, work on presence. And this was designed to measure the degree or quality of presence that uh, users experienced after using an immersive environment. And uh, there's obviously the definition of presence according to Whitmer. Um, so I had the students score uh, a number of qualities about the experience, which ranged from how distracting they found uh, the exterior environment, so their environment outside of the immersive uh, environment, how distracting they found the hardware, so the, the VR headset and the controllers. Um, and that these were ranked on a one to seven scale. So I found uh, quite apparently after sort of going through all of these, that the highest presence scores were correlated with, uh, maybe that's in the next slide, but so a high score was 184. That was the highest possible score. If you answered uh, seven on all of them, so maximal presence, and the lowest was negative eight with an average of 88. And then I assigned all the students in the class um, a sort of code name where you corresponded to undergraduate and G was a graduate, and then gave them a number simply based on the order that I went through them in. The highest presence scores were 145 and 140, and the lowest were 82 and 92. So really only one was below the average. Um, and as, in addition to the uh, presence questionnaire, I also had the students write uh, a simple couple of sentences at the end um, talking about their, what they thought of the experience. And the higher presence scores were definitely associated with the enthusiasm of the written responses. Uh, so for example, they, the ones that had really high presence scores said it was easy to figure out and an enjoyable experience. Um, lower presence scores noted that the VR hardware was either uncomfortable or distracting or defective, or it was confusing in some way. Uh, for example, the controllers may not have been turned on or the lenses were scratched or blurry, uh, or they weren't able to wear their um, glasses while doing the experience, so they found they couldn't really see it, which is all totally understandable, but I guess luckily for me, it didn't mean that the experience itself was defective or distracting in some way. 
And I think this, as a, as a case study, is um, useful for a number of reasons. There's not really any literature on best practices uh, of design for and with VR. Uh, the ma majority of this, the research and the practice, is being done by private companies like Oculus or game studios. And they don't, they're not open with what, what they're doing and why. Uh, because it's obviously intellectual property and that's how they make their money. Um, and it's also useful because all of these technologies are, are changing really rapidly. Not only Unity and uh, the VR hardware itself, but also the software that um, is used to make these as well as make even the 3D models uh, under them, the photogrammetric software. So my idea when I started this was to replicate, obviously, the physical experience of being in one of these spaces as closely as possible, both in terms of scale, uh, lighting, and atmosphere, while also augmenting it with this sort of commentary by art historians, the experts, um, that you saw in the previous slide with situated learning, uh, where having expert sort of chaperones is key. Uh, and also this virtual scaffolding to allow up-close inspection of details. So really what I wanted to make this was um, sort of a private tour where you would have experts telling you what you were looking at and you could effectively get up on a ladder and go up as close to these things as you wanted to. And the first draft uh, that I made, the Siena government frescoes, and released, uh, sent out to the students and the instructor, uh, was not very good in, in retrospect <laughs> for a number of reasons that I then changed and rectified based on feedback. Um, but essentially what it was was the 3D interior, a single audio track that played on a loop, and virtual scaffolding that allowed close-up inspection of these frescoes. Now, when you look at this, it's not clear if you've never used virtual reality before, um, you're not familiar with uh, 3D models or virtual spaces, it's not clear what you're supposed to do here. Um, so there's no, you saw earlier those uh, numbers that indicated potentially places to go. In the initial draft, uh, users were simply loaded into this virtual space um, and there was no prompting to do anything. And that was understandably quite confusing. Uh, the the so-called virtual scaffolding are actually there, but obviously you can't see them because they would obscure the view of the frescoes from the, the floor. Um, so I needed to revise this and add in more direction and prompting that at the same time wouldn't also visually detract from the fluidity of the experience or the, the visual experience. So I split the audio into multiple nodes. Uh, another problem was because the audio simply started playing, a lot of people just stood there looking around. They weren't quite sure what the audio was talking about. It was simply a straight track um, playing from their YouTube video, about a nine minute track. Uh, and it also wasn't particularly clear if you could move around while this was happening or, and so on. So the first thing I did was split the audio into nodes that were roughly sequential. Um, and I numbered these so that there would be, the audio wouldn't start playing until a user teleported to one of these numbers. And I also added in uh, something called destination point teleportation. So that when a user went to uh, a node there, so the effects of bad government is one of these nodes, when the user teleported there, it would automatically move them up to the virtual scaffolding um, above, which was a, a light gray plane that was sort of floating in the air. It was like a virtual catwalk that was up at the level of the frescoes. And that would happen automatically. The user would teleport there, it would simply move them up to that level. This uh, introduced new problems, obviously, that it was startling and disconcerting if you tried to go someplace and then you were suddenly moved 20 feet away without being told. Uh, and it also led people to believe that these numbers were the only places they could move in the space. Uh, when in reality, you could 
you could go, you don't necessarily even have to follow these numbers, you can move around freely. Um, but this, uh, so those are some things that I think I've developed solutions for and that I'd like to, to implement if this is gonna be used in the future. Uh, there are also some unique challenges posed by the simple spatial layout of some of these spaces. So this one, for the majority of them, actually, uh, three of the four are very tall, narrow chapels, um, which means that if you want to view any of these upper frescoes, you need to start putting in platforms for all of those. And uh, moving around between those can get very confusing and disorienting, not to mention uh, sort of acrophobic because you, uh, the, the feeling of presence in here is very high and it's even higher when you're suddenly moved uh, 40 feet up in the air and you're looking over the edge of a, a platform at what appears to be the ground uh, 40 feet below you. So there were some um, problems with how to navigate between all of these and that, that's where the destination point teleport came in again. Um, so as I, as I would say to sort of wrap this up, uh, the key the key insights came from observing and talking to students and users as they, they use these uh, VR experiences and immediately after they'd use them. Um, that's where I got the most information from because a lot of what I designed and thought would work uh, when I saw it in action, it was clear that it uh, was not as intuitive as I thought it would be. So in the future, I would actually like to, to be more rigorous about note taking um, on people's uh, comments and critiques. And obviously the, some next steps here, uh, because I would like this to be used in the next year's iteration of this class. And the professor uh, Knox implied that um, he would like that. So I think with some minor uh, revisions, it could um, be a sort of standard uh, component of the class going forward. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned the potential logistical issue of how we want to get students access to VR headsets. Um, do you remember how you ended up solving that and what Yeah. So the when I was initially brainstorming this idea with um, the professor in the class, uh, we came up with three potential ways that it could be used. Either the professor could uh, wear the headset for five to 10 minutes in the class as he was talking about a particular subject, and it would almost be as though he were in the place giving a tour to the students who were watching uh, what he was seeing on a screen. I thought there were a number of reasons that that wouldn't work from my standpoint, the main one being that the students wouldn't get the benefit of the immersive environment. Uh, the professor also raised the point that um, it's also a little, it's alienating if you're wearing goggles and you can't see the, the class. So uh, those were both valid reasons not to do that, I think. Um, the, the second option was that I would bring in one or two laptops and headsets, set them up, before the class and then for half the class after the professor had lectured on the particular subject, the students would be able to use the VR environments. Uh, that I think would not have worked for a number of reasons. Uh, the simple logistics of me having to lug all that hardware over there. Uh, and then I think there were 15 people in this class. The students would have only been able to get two to three minutes um, a piece on it before having to switch. Plus then you have all the other students sitting there not being able to do anything or being or watching or something. Uh, and then the third option was to use one of the VR labs on campus, the one here in Wells being the, the one we decided on um, simply because it was open most of the time. It was open 10 to four were the hours. Uh, and I think it can't be reserved. So it can't be blocked off for classes or any sort of use, it's, it's open to be used by first come first serve basically. Whereas a number of the other VR classrooms 
either have classes in them at certain times or they can be reserved and it, it was uh, confusing. And there was, and the key element I would say uh, is not only that, that it was open for use, but also that there, there was a staff there that um, could facilitate and troubleshoot and, and help. Uh, so really the only hiccup was, I think a week after giving out the initial uh, VR build to the students to download at Wells Library, UITS rebuilt all the machines and didn't reinstall <laughs> a key piece of uh, VR, Steam VR on them. <laughs> but they, they fixed that really quickly, I'd say within like three or four days. So uh, it really wasn't even a hiccup at all because I was also re revising these uh, after the initial feedback. Oh yeah, um, Tassie asked if you don't know Unity very well, uh, what do I, how do I think a sort of Google Cardboard mobile VR experience would compare? Is that, uh, personally I've never used, I haven't used those lately in the past couple years. Um, I remember using them a couple years ago, putting my phone in a Google Cardboard and using the the magnetic switch on the side to teleport around. Uh, I found that I don't think it would work for something like this because of how complex the model is and, and how high resolution the textures would have to be. Uh, but it could work. You just have to be, I think it's, it's a different set of questions at that point that revolve more about the constraints of the, the hardware and what you can do in it versus what you can do in, in Unity, for example. Of course, you could. Well, yeah, yeah. That's what I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. So these models, I would say, are getting a lot of their resolution from the photographs. It's not as geom geometry heavy. Uh, it, it also helps that for the most part, they're relatively simple spaces. They're basically boxes uh, with maybe a vaulted ceiling or um, the Sienna ceiling is, is more complex. But for the most part, they're, they're pretty simple spaces. They just have very high resolution textures on them. Yeah, should I repeat it or? Okay. Okay, so um, the question was Did I consider other forms of locomotion in, inside the, the virtual reality app, like uh, flying or, or using the keyboard or directional pad? Uh, no, I didn't because I've used uh, VR quite a bit and I still find that those types of locomotion, whether it's um, walking, so smooth locomotion or flying are, are kind of nauseating. Um, and I knew that the audience that I was making these for had most likely zero experience with uh, virtual reality. So I didn't want to do anything that would potentially make them more ill than they were already going to get. <laughs> I brought a laptop, yeah.